uh, we'll, so we'll dedicate the first few minutes just to some uh, opening uh, opening remarks. I'm, I'm Tom Trevi, I'm the director of the Columbia Global Center in Rio de Janeiro, and I'm welcoming the speakers and all of you who are who are tuning into our Zoom call to the second in a 10-part series uh, on the changing role of the state Brazil in global perspective. Uh, this is the second session we launched last night uh, uh, where we focused a little bit more than we are today on the global economy in the post-pandemic period, although we did make specific reference uh, to Brazil. Uh, just a quick word uh, on what we're trying to do in this semester-long series. We have in mind more than an isolated series of, of, of webinars, as interesting as each individually may be, but we see the whole greater than the sum of the parts. We see it as a chance to reinsert Brazil, which is turned in on itself and frankly down on its luck uh, into uh, uh, the global conversation, reinserted into the global conversation and growth and equity in the post pandemic world and, and called the attention of a world that frankly, Brazil is not paying much attention to and is not paying very much attention to, to Brazil. So that's sort of broadly speaking, what we're trying to do in these uh, webinars, and we'll do it in a regular systematic May, a way on a monthly basis through, through the month of May. Today, we will go back and start with the global economy, uh, and, uh, but, the, and, but then the focus will pretty soon turn, uh, for the majority of our great speakers today, more to Brazil. We have an excellent, excellent group of economists and political analysts who could, are well prepared to uh, address this specific topic today, which are structural challenges uh, and uh, to growth uh, in Brazil and, and in the world. Uh, I will e introduce each of our, our speakers. It's a pleasure to have them uh, individually in more detail uh, when it comes their turn to speak. But here I'm just sending out a word of greetings and thanks to Eber Revoltella, Laura Carvalho, uh, Ed Aman, Otaviano Canuto, Alvaro Pereira, and, uh, and Albert Fischel. So welcome quickly to the panelists. Uh, thanks very much for being with us. These seminars, are, uh, Global and Brazil, are a joint venture. I sort of do the, global, the Brazil part of it. I'm based here in Rio for Colombia. But my very good colleague, uh, Jan Svenjar, is a distinguished labor economist at Columbia SIPA and director at Columbia SIPA Center on Global Economic Governance. And he's really the driving force be uh, behind the, this series uh, working with me. And Jan, I'd like to turn it over to you. Uh, then I'll start off the program. But I wanted to give you just a, uh, an opportunity to say a few words uh, 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 by way of opening remarks. Jan? Well, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. And uh, let me welcome on behalf of the Center on Global Economic Governance and SIPA, all the panelists. It's a great lineup that we have here. Let me welcome all the participants. Uh, this really looks like a very, very a nice round table within the overall series, which as Tom mentioned, will include also fiscal issues, monetary issues, labor issues, and so on. So the goal is to put Brazil and the emerging markets in a global perspective. And uh, we started yesterday, and it's wonderful that Deborah will continue today with the European perspective, and then we'll turn more to the Latin American Brazilian uh, perspective as such. So uh, let me welcome you, and thank you very much for participating in this great endeavor. Tom, thank back you. to you. Thank you, Jan, and we'll call you back in, hopefully, uh, in the, uh, at later in the, in the agenda. Thank you, Jan uh, Svenjar. Uh, just some quick housekeeping remarks. It, it takes a village to do this. Uh, this experimental series of conferences successfully. So you all have a, a role uh, a role to play, uh, please. Uh, your questions and answers are important. If we don't actually answer them live uh, in the 90 minutes or so that we have with you, they will be answered. And it's important to get your feedback. Uh, and uh, uh, so please use that Q&A function down there at the, at the bottom of your screens. Uh, our, our speakers, who, all of whom could talk for 90 minutes just by themselves, and it'd be well worth every minute, well worth listening to. I've asked them to keep it to eight to 10 minutes uh, so that we can go quickly and cover a broad range of areas and still have some time for comments at the end. So with that, and taking off from Jan's uh, opening remarks, um, our first speaker uh, today uh, is uh, Deborah, is an old friend of the uh, this, uh, Columbia University and the Columbia Global Center in Rio, Deborah Revoltella. Deborah is originally from Italy, and she is the director of economics of the economics department at the EIB, the European Investment Bank in Luxembourg. The Ooh, uh, Banco de Investimento. Economic analysis to support all EIB operations, and uh, 
global phys positioning as well as the, the EIB group's uh, policy and strategy definitions. Her, she's, she's very busy. She, her, her department comprises some 40 economists and it looks at economic uh, conditions globally in Europe. So uh, they are in charge of sovereign and financial rating models for the EIB uh, as well. So Deborah, you are sort of a link, a uh, human link to this conversation last night and a reminder that uh, we don't want to be looking at Brazil in only in, uh, in, a, in uh, 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 a, within. We want to see the global context. So we welcome you now for your remarks, Deborah. Thanks again for being with us. Thank you very much. And uh, it's uh, really an honor uh, to, to be back in this uh, series of seminars. Uh, I actually enjoyed more when I was able to come physically, but uh, today I'm uh, connecting uh, via web from uh, a very rainy Luxembourg. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a part of the beauty of uh, webinars, uh, but uh, is uh, the sadness of the current moment that impeded is uh, the, the uh, the more uh, lively physical uh, uh, meeting. Um, I, I wanted to, so I have been asked to talk about uh, the European uh, situation and actually bridge between uh, the discussion on uh, the global level yesterday and uh, the future discussion on Brazil. And the way in which I was uh, um, uh, putting together my thoughts was uh, uh, to look at uh, what we have seen so far on the COVID crisis uh, in uh, Europe. What has been uh, the um, policy response that we have seen so far? And what are uh, the challenges ahead? Uh, and uh, what we can expect uh, going forward uh, uh, with uh, this crisis? Um, I, will, uh, um, I will actually not go through slide, but I just uh, put together some, some thoughts. So at the European, the Europe, uh, we all know, has been uh, one of the regions very much affected uh, by, by the COVID crisis. Uh, Italy was actually the second country uh, most affected, uh, starting in February 2020. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, the, the strategies uh, put in place uh, for containing uh, the, uh, the virus uh, with lockdown uh, put in place uh, quite early in, uh, in Europe meant uh, an immediate uh, shock on, uh, on the economy. And what we have seen in the first uh, um, two quarter of uh, last year is an immediate and very strong effect in terms of uh, GDP dynamics, which on a cumulative basis uh, led to some 15% uh, drop in some of the countries uh, at the European level. What the crisis also brought, however, was a very strong massive and a really timely policy response that we have seen at the European level that somehow was benefiting from the knowledge acquired in the previous global financial crisis that, as everybody knows, in Europe also led to a subsequent sovereign crisis. So the policy response was immediate and was uh, aimed uh, at uh, preventing uh, some of, of the shocks of the economy that uh, we had uh, seen in the previous crisis uh, coming. On the first uh, side, and uh, at the European level, uh, the policy response uh, was uh, uh, composed by various components, so a lot of uh, national fiscal policy, part of a uh, European uh, uh, extraordinary fiscal rule, and then uh, the rule of the ECB calming market uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, quantitative easing. On the fiscal side, uh, um, what, uh, what has happened at various levels, uh, uh, at the national level and uh, with uh, different instruments uh, put in place in various member states, it has been a complex uh, uh, mixture of uh, schemes looking at uh, how to protect individuals, how to protect uh, corporates, and, how to, um, and, and, then, uh, and then how to protect at the end also the banking sector in the short term. So the measure has been going from uh, schemes on the labor market. I think the Kurzarbeit, the, 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 the German schemes has been uh, rolled out almost everywhere in Europe and also in other parts of the world allowing the people to remain attached to the job market, to their own jobs, in which uh, 
social security and a part-time work, a part-time stay at home being paid by the social insurance schemes. And through a European support, this has been backed up by special financing coming also from the European Union and the European Commission. So this has been a, an immediate stabilizer effect with the objective of keeping people attached to their jobs, but at the same time allowing companies to manage part-time work, which was necessary due to lockdowns and to reduce economic activities and keeping the companies alive. On a second point of view and directed to, to companies, part of the policy support has been going through um, delayed payment, delaying tax, uh, tax payments. Um, of course, the social contribution was also positively affecting firms, but also uh, issues like a moratoria or debt and a lot of schemes put in place at the national level and then counter guaranteed by the European level, in that case by the European Investment Bank, which um, guarantee, guarantee credit, providing guarantee to credits of companies. And this has been quite useful because it has allowed in this phase of the crisis to keep the credit channel open for companies. So another measure set to keep the stability and keep companies alive. And then the third element of the crisis has been related looking at allowing member states to expand their fiscal policy. At the European level, we have constraints in terms of out of um, fiscal space for country for different countries, a part of the growing stability pact. It has been a temporary abandon, a temporary flexibility, which allowed the countries to, to open to very expansionary fiscal policies for a period of time. And then the ECB entering with reinforced quantitative easing that basically allow all countries to comfortably refinance them at a very low rate and with a very predictable financing condition. So it's a very complex set of measures put in place, and as I was saying, combining a national and the European measure. On top of this, and that has been the revolution, um, the innovative part, if you want, at the European level, a European joint issuing of bonds for, of bonds for the recovery and resilience facilities, so for specific facility um, that is aiming at the structural transformation of, count, of countries, basically, and of counterparts, particularly focused to the digital and green transition. And again, this is a, an extraordinary rule that has been put in place to have um, a European response on top of the national response. So what, with all of these, uh, as I was saying, a massive shocks, a massive response. What we have seen is after the massive shocks, uh, when in Q3, in the, the third quarter of last year, the milder um, weather condition allowed uh, to keep uh, temporary the virus more under control. What we have seen uh, is uh, that the economy was, uh, thanks to the massive uh, policy support, was uh, uh, very easily rebounding uh, very fast. And a very strong rebound uh, has been uh, then uh, challenged again uh, with uh, the second wave uh, coming. And that is uh, where we come. So with the second wave coming, a number of, and despite the vaccine, the um, very strong uncertainty that we see, see still remaining pose a number of questions on the future and the key challenge that we see going forward. And the key challenge are the following. On the one side, uh, I think uh, the, the fact that is uh, very clear is uh, that uh, this recovery is going to be very asymmetric, asymmetric in terms of sectors, but also in terms of kind of firms and firms uh, that uh, received uh, differentiated policy support at uh, the national level. 
And this is a, a key challenge for Europe because of the inequality that it will generate in the European market and also divergence among countries going forward. The second point is related to, um, to the source of finance. As I was saying, the old policy support kept the credit finance ongoing for firms but this is gradually inducing an increase of leverage for companies. And that's a pose the question on the, on the financing, the bias between debt and equity financing at the European level, and the need to develop a new equity kind of instrument to support corporate going forward. A third challenge is related to the social dimension. The crisis is very much affecting much more the lower tier of the economy and also at the regional level it's increasing the challenge for regions that were already in trouble because of the digital and green transition and that is requiring some rethinking of the social policy and education policy that at the european level are still very much national not european and, uh, and in this specific element, I think uh, one opportunity and uh, so far a lost opportunity is uh, that in the moment in which the courts are right mechanisms are put in place, uh, these uh, temporary work uh, schemes, uh, one could uh, try to tie them uh, to formal, uh, to increase uh, re-education, retraining uh, for people to prepare them uh, for new jobs. And then the last point, the last challenge that we see at the European level, I think is the fact that, uh, again, the, the, the possibility of opening to, um, to again, to uh, long-term asymmetries in the moment in which the fiscal room at the national level may differ going forward. So far, with uh, the... Um, fiscal rule put on all the old countries that were able to um, adopt the fiscal policy to support the restructuring of the economy. The real challenge is that every in the last 40 years, every time that we saw this fiscal expansion, they were then followed by fiscal consolidation. And then uh, 10 years after the episode of fiscal consolidation, we always saw public investment below trend, um, even after 10 years of this uh, fiscal consolidation. So the, the challenge is uh, that uh, the, the extraordinary effort uh, to counter the crisis in the, short term, uh, in the short term may lead in the medium to long term uh, to very different uh, capacity at the fiscal side uh, at the single country level and then a uh, different policy. So at the, at the moment in Europe, we are still in the middle and then closing, and we are still completely in the middle of uncertainty. I think the, the challenge that we are facing uh, are uh, related to, to, um, to what is going to happen with the second round effect of the crisis, the economic crisis to corporate, to inequality and social inequality and regional inequality at the European level, and uh, asymmetries uh, in the recovery and asymmetries uh, among the member states. And I think I close with this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you so much, Deborah. Deborah. An enormous Deborah. amount of ground, and it will be back here, so excuse me. Thank you, enormous amount of ground in a, in a vast region, and we appreciate that uh, syn synthesis uh, from a regional point of view. We turn now more specifically to Brazil, and I'm gonna turn to Laura Car Banyu, who's uh, with us this morning, joining us from Sao Paulo, where she is at the uh, Faculty of Economics and Administration at the University of Sao Paulo. She has her master's degrees here from uh, the Federal University in Rio and her doctorate in economics from the New School uh, in New York. Her research areas uh, cover the waterfront too, but she's in macroeconomics, economic development, income distribution uh, are some of the areas Lauda has focused on. She is also uh, very much of a public figure here in Brazil, a frequent commentator in print and electronic media. And her books, uh, her many books include a provocative 2018 work on how the Brazilian economy went off the rails. <laughs> so we're anxious to have a little bit of an update. Maybe we'll hear from Laura this morning. Laura also should be said, I hope I've got this right. Laura played an instrumental role in bringing Thomas Piketty's 
monumental work on capitalism in the 21st century to Brazil in the, in the Portuguese language version. I hope I have that right. And I think you deserve recognition for that. She is obviously one of the more important younger voices in the economic policy debate in Brazil. And it's a pleasure to welcome you, Laura. Seja muito bem-vinda. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, uh, for the invitation and for uh, giving me the opportunity to, particip to participate in this panel. I hope you are hearing me well. Yes, yes, it's fine. And I will get started uh, in these eight minutes. Um, basically, I, I think um, Deborah has already presented um, a great synthesis of, of the world uh, situation after the, the shock. But of course, Latin America uh, had some specificities and some structural um, challenges and other more, uh, let's say, short run challenges to deal with when the pandemic hit us. And I'll start by presenting what I think happened in 2020, and in particular in Brazil, but also differences with other countries in the region. And, and then I'll, I'll move on into the, the challenges this year and in the post-pandemic. So to start with, I, I would say that, uh, of course, some issues uh, and some, some structural problems that the world faces have been uh, stressed by uh, the type of shock that the coronavirus uh, represented to, to the world and inequality is one of them. Of course, transformations in the labor market is another. Uh, but I would say that Latin America ha has all of those problems uh, to a greater extent and of course more exacerbated. And so um, we, we had to cope in the region with not only um, the, the cost of these structural uh, deficiencies and, and difficulties, um, uh, high levels of inequality in all dimensions, uh, of course, the share of services in GDP, uh, in particular tourism and, and personal services that were disproportionately hit by uh, this crisis, um, the, the level of informality, the degree of informality in the labor market, which varies between 30 and up to 80% in the region, depending on the country um, of the labor force. Uh, and of course, all of these things uh, may help explain the current projections of uh, a fall of around 8% of GDP. I'm using IMF projections in South America as uh, um, Whereas in North America, the, the projections uh, go around minus four or a little bit more, uh, even minus 5% of GDP, but already we can see the difference. And I think part of the difference relates to those structural challenges that uh, pay the high price, let's say. But of course, in spite of these uh, structural difficulties, um, we had uh, a heterogeneous response to the crisis in the region when it comes to two other dimensions that I think were crucial to explain uh, the magnitude of the recession that we will face and of course the difficulties as well um, as we move forward in the recovery process. So first, of course, the health, um, the, the control of the virus itself and there uh, countries in South America varied uh, significantly in how well they have responded in, in, in the health front. Uh, of course, Brazil there um, is, let's say, uh, even an outlier in a region that already responded pretty badly to, to, to the crisis uh, in this area. And, and there, I think, um, as we moved to, to, to next year, um, not only the control of the virus itself will keep being important to, to dictate the, the pace and the rhythm of the recovery, but also the, 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 how, how, uh, how we manage to, to vaccinate the population will be crucial. And, and there again, Brazil seems to be doing pretty badly uh, relative to, even relative to its neighbors and to other middle income or low income uh, countries, right? Uh, the second area where we, we did, let's say, much better than average in 2020, uh, and that is also crucial to explain our uh, economic situation is uh, our fiscal and monetary 
response, but in particular, I'll focus here on the fiscal response. So Brazil, if we rank 176 countries that are analyzed in their specific uh, response to fiscal response to the COVID-19 crisis in the IMF fiscal monitor, ranks 16 in the size of the additional spending and foregone revenue relative to GDP. So we had basically more than 8.4%, around 8.4% GDP of, of national GDP in additional spending. Uh, in 2020, the average of the, the world, let's say 176 countries included in the database, is 3.9%. So Brazil had a fiscal response comparable to those of the advanced economies. And, 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 uh, and in that sense, uh, managed to compensate part of the failure in the health front and in, say, the structural, the more structural uh, difficulties that, that we had. And, and I think that's where we find the, the main explanation for the fact that the GDP, the fall of GDP in Brazil uh, in 2020 is now projected uh, by financial institutions to be around 4.3%. Of course, it's a very deep annual recession, probably the deepest since we have a statistical uh, series, but that's still quite, uh, that it's still much lower than the, uh, the, Nash, the world average. Uh, it's lower than several of our neighbors. So for instance, Peru also had a strong fiscal response as did Chile. Uh, they, they had a fiscal stance that was allowed for that to happen. But Peru, for instance, uh, had in the IMF latest projection a fall of GDP uh, of 2020 predicted in 14%. Argentina, which who faced uh, much stronger fiscal constraints due to uh, a foreign debt problem that Brazil did not have, um, um, will probably um, face more than 10% uh, in, in, uh, in terms of the fall of GDP in 2020. So uh, just to say that I think uh, when it comes to the result of the crisis, given how badly we, we, we coped with the, with the coronavirus itself and how bad inequality is and uh, other structural difficulties, including the fact that we, we were already, we had been in a crisis for the past five years in Brazil, even before the virus, hit the country with very high levels of unemployment, informality in the labor market. I mean, it's still, we, it's clear that we have attenuated uh, significantly our fall in GDP due to this fiscal response. And, and there uh, relies uh, at the same time an opportunity, but also what, what is really concerning when, as we move ahead. Because um, from this response, the most significant part is due, and, of, and including the effect of attenuating uh, the, the fall of GDP, is due to our cash relief program, the Auxilio Emergencial, uh, which um, decimated more than 3% of GDP. That represents more than six times the annual value of the program Bolsa Familia, uh, which is already the largest cash transfer, conditioned cash transfer program in the world uh, in much less time. Uh, so it really beneficiated, um, the, the number of beneficiaries was much larger. It, it touched more than 75, it directly affected more than 75 million uh, people. Uh, plus the, the amount that was transfer, transferred is much larger than, than, than uh, other, than Bolsa Familia and other, even other, other cash relief programs that were, were done relative to our income uh, during the pandemic around the world. And that created a, a contradicting, a little bit of a paradox situation in 2020, um, because even though the crisis was one of the deepest, uh, poverty levels have dropped to their historical lows. Uh, we had uh, inequality when adding, of course, labor, in, labor income inequality, wage inequalities have increased a lot. Uh, 
um, due to uh, the disproportionate impact of the economic shock in low-skilled uh, labor and in, in sectors that are intensive in low-skilled labor, services, etc. Uh, but still, as, as we add the, the per capita income value of the Auxilio Emergencial, the cash relief program, we see how inequality as a whole has fallen and how 50%, the bottom 50% of the distribution were even able to more than neutralize uh, their fall in income due to the program. So they had an increase uh, in, in their average income uh, during this crisis, right? And, and, and the good part there is that we saw how big an effect is of actually including uh, social protection to a much larger extent in our federal budget. And I'll conclude. Uh, but uh, the, the, the other um, the other part of the story is that we, we come to 2021 uh, with an abrupt end of this program happening now in January and the rising inequality, the rising labor income inequality that had been neutralized so far, we appear, will appear out of a sudden um, and we'll have a, a dramatic cost in terms of our perspectives of recovery. So the fiscal stimulus that helped us attenuate the crisis will be removed out of a sudden. We, and we will be left with all the other factors that were actually contributing to make the crisis worse, right? And, and now the situation really, uh, in terms of uh, how we move forward, I, I have, uh, I project really that um, our economic recovery will be much slower than the global economic recovery as opposed to what happened in last year, meaning our, our fall in GDP was um, mild relative to the other countries. And now it would be exactly the opposite because the only factor that was helping us is being removed. Um, I will end now, uh, maybe in the discussion we can uh, try to set, I, I do have some proposals and, and, and things that we can be thought uh, they, they all hit a wall, uh, which is the current Brazilian spending ceiling um, that I think is playing, uh, is, is unsustainable and is, and is playing a very um, uh, bad role at the moment in terms of uh, helping us set an agenda for a green and inclusive uh, post-pandemic recovery in Brazil. That's a, that's a great, thank a you. Great, a great opening statement, Laura, thank you. Very much. Yeah, you left us kind of there at the end. Uh, uh, Want to hear more about some of those proposals of what can be done. Brazil in a very difficult position in uh, in 2021. Contrasting a bit with what Deborah told us was the outlook for the bulk of, of the countries in Europe. We 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 turn uh, now uh, to our good, very good friend Ed Aman. Ed is a professor uh, of uh, Brazilian studies at Leiden University and a visiting professor at Seis Johns Hopkins University. And there. Uh, Bologna uh, campus. Ed was previously at the University of Manchester and a research fellow at, at Oxford. He is a prolific, as are most people on this call, prolific author and editor. Along with uh, two co-authors, he produced uh, in 2018 a masterly, a masterly review of the structural issues in Brazil entitled, uh, and published by Oxford, entitled The Oxford Handbook of the Brazilian Economy, a uh, standard reference for anyone teaching in this area. His latest book, Ed's latest book just out, uh, served as a sort of inspiration to this particular conference session. It is entitled uh, The Brazilian Economy Confronting Structural Challenges. So on that uh, note, uh, Ed, uh, welcome to the call. We would uh, look forward to your eight to 10 minutes of opening comments. Thank you, Ed. Okay, thanks very much, Tom, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, yes, um, I'd like to make a few general comments regarding the structural constraints the Brazilian economy faces. We've already had some analysis on that, and maybe I can dive into one or two more specific issues, and maybe one or two more positive points. And I'm going to try to share just a very few slides with you. Let's see if this works. Um, no, a uh, host has disabled uh, participant screen sharing. So well, I... We'll get that fixed. We're going to have fixed in just a quick second. Uh, we okay. need to enable your, uh, your that screen. Would enabled. That would be great. Is it ready yet? Uh, still disabled. 
And I'll try again. Yep. And yeah, now you can. Yep. Yeah. This is always the most stressful moment in any presentation. <laughs> Getting the slides to work. Can everyone see this? Can everyone see this? Beautiful. Okay, excellent. All right. Well, my comments are partly based on uh, the book, which has uh, officially been published just in the last few days, although it was released in the last few weeks of um, 2020. Tendency. Um, in many events, many analyses, to focus on the here and now. And the here and now is usually a crisis point of some nature or other. And uh, some of the underlying drivers that bias Brazil towards crisis episodes are sometimes overlooked. And what I'm trying to do in this book, and indeed what I did in the handbook with uh, others, is to dive a little bit beneath the surface, to pop the hood on this thing, and to see what's really going on and what kinds of structural problems need to be fixed in order for Brazil uh, to move forward. And I really identify three sets of challenges uh, which you can look at in the book in much more detail, of course, those centering on competitiveness and the supply side, productivity issues especially, those around critical macroeconomic issues, especially the configuration of fiscal policy and the tendency of the public sector to run recurrent very large deficits. And thirdly, a part of the mix, extremely important, lack of social inclusion and lack of environmental sustainability, which are themselves problems on their own, but they're also impediments to growth. So they operate in, the, in these two dimensions. So I'm just going to dive very, very quickly into some of this. I mean, it's not even a broad brush approach. I mean, it really is just a kind of mere, mere amuse-bouche for those of you who want to dive in further. And I think the first point I'd like to make um, centers on just how volatile and in fact rather disappointing growth has been in Brazil over the last five to ten years um, and if one compares this to the earlier period during the import substitution era for example from the 50s through to the uh, mid-1970s generally speaking average growth is a lot higher it's come down but the volatility has not um, disappeared and you know one of the roots behind this one of the key structural issues is uh, recurrent underinvestment. If you look at this particular chart, you'll just notice how Brazil's capital formation lags that of the OECD and way lags that of China. Um, so one of the big questions Brazil has to face is how can we get investment uh, ramping up again? Uh, and that's something that um, I'm going to return to uh, right at the very end of the day. And another issue, in fact, I drew this from the OECD report, which was mentioned right at the start of today's session, has to do with Brazil's total factor productivity. Um, and again, comparing Brazil against Chile, China, Korea, the United States here, there's a, there's a clear problem. It's TFP is lagging. Um, and for a country which badly needs to play catch up and to raise its living standards and to engineer a rapid recovery, as was mentioned by the last speaker uh, from the COVID crisis, this is a central issue which uh, badly needs addressing. And that has a number of drivers around capital formation, but also around um, human capital, investment in education, vocational education, and so on. And uh, my book goes into that issue in quite some detail for those of you who want to follow up. And on the education issue, um, it's worth consulting some of the PISA data that the OECD put out, and no doubt we'll have some more comments on that later. And what this shows is that despite Brazil's relatively um, buoyant investment in the education area over the last 20 years, um, progress has been relatively modest in terms of moving up the rankings. It's not a disaster area, uh, but Brazil clearly has to do more in order to capacitate its people to cope with wrenching changes in the global economy and to get uh, productivity, labour productivity, moving up where it should be. And uh, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but clearly there's enormous fiscal stress 
on Brazil at the moment. Again, the previous speaker alluded to this. Uh, and in, in, in a sense, that's quite a good thing. It's acting, of course, very much against the crisis. It's being a shock absorber, the amount of extra spending, the emergency spending. Um, but th that started at the from a point in time where Brazil's fiscal accounts were already under great pressure. And it's become increasingly difficult to realize discretionary forms of expenditure, uh, which could boost investment, that could boost education, that could get the economy moving again. And Brazil is going to have to return to these fiscal dilemmas uh, once the crisis abates. And I think that's going to be a very, very interesting question going forward. And of course, we can't ignore the environmental pressures which continue to bear down on Brazil's economy. Deforestation has started to pick up again. It's And not only that, it's come much to the fore in terms of global public attention. And I think this, you know, this kind of risk that Brazil is now running of, of, of alienating potential trading partners, potential investment partners, um, unless it gets its environmental house in order. I mean, this is always a very important issue, but I think it's coming up uh, in orders of magnitude of the list of priorities. Now, uh, I'm not pretending that no structural reform has been undertaken. Clearly, that's not true. Uh, there are a number of areas that one could look at. Um, but one I just want to focus on right at the end here before I kind of expire my time, and that's reform in the financial markets, uh, where there's in fact been a lot of innovation and change, some born of institutional regulation, uh, some born of technological change, some born of sheer raw entrepreneurship. And um, we see the changes really stemming from four key areas. First, the monetary transition, which has enabled interest rates to get to record lows because inflation has come down. Again, I think that's been mentioned already. Um, comparatively recent reforms in the stock and bond markets make them a more attractive place to raise funds. But also um, in the last five to 10 years, this financial technological revolution, so-called rise of the fintechs, uh, which has really taken off in Brazil and has pr provided new forms of financial intermediation uh, for, for Brazilians either looking to, to lend money or, or indeed to, to borrow it to finance investment. And I think the question is whether that momentum can be maintained and whether investment and productivity can be driven up as a result. There are some hopeful signs in the wind if you look at some of this data, you see increasing corporate bond issuance, for example, as a portion of GDP, increasing portion of credit uh, as a portion of GDP, and we see Brazil's interest rate spreads, although very high by global standards, nonetheless coming down over the last few years. So I think this is one area where I think at least in terms of external observers of the Brazilian economy, it's tended to pass them by. Um, you know, people have been fixated on pensions reforms, on fiscal reforms, to some extent on the, on the environment, but they've tended to ignore a lot of fundamental changes taking place in Brazil's financial sector, which are actually quite positive. And there are some other positives I could mention in terms of science and technology, life sciences, and so on and so forth, but um, we don't have time to go into that. So um, there, there are lots of reasons to be concerned. There are lots of unaddressed structural difficulties, but there are straws in the wind that indicate uh, that Brazil is beginning to grapple with some of the key issues. And uh, no doubt we're gonna get into that a little bit later in today's session. So if you wanna you know, find out any more, um, of course most of you know a lot about it anyway, but for those of you who are curious to read a bit more, there's the book just published. But if you want the, the kind of telephone directory version. Uh, uh, the, this is the book that Tom mentioned uh, at the beginning of this, uh, The Handbook of the Brazilian Economy, where I believe there's actually a contribution uh, featuring Tom in there. So if that's not incentive enough, I'll have a look at the book. I don't know what to do. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, no doubt we'll pick up on this later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little okay. extra incentive to pick up will, the book. I will share this now. There very, very good. Very good. Return the screen to us. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, for that, uh, taking us so, uh, uh, fitting us so well with the previous uh, 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 opening remarks and, and uh, covering so much ground in, in a very short period of time. So uh, now we'll turn to Ottaviano Canuto, uh, a stranger to no one, a friend to all. Ottavio Canuto is, uh, I'm proud to say, Giorgio Pablo Lemon, visiting professor of public policy uh, this year at uh, Columbia University, where he's associated with the Lemon Center for Brazilian Studies at Columbia University. 
uh, also a prolific writer and blogger uh, fo focused on emerging markets economies with obviously a special love and concern for Brazil, but Otaviano really, really does see Brazil in comparative international perspective, which is the viewpoint we value here. He is well known in Brazil, in fact, probably best known in Brazil for his many years of service in the economics department of UNICAMP, where he tutored many uh, doctoral uh, students. Um, uh, and uh, after some service, briefly, I believe, in the Brazilian Ministry of Finance, where he worked on external issues there, Otaviano has had an absolutely uh, admirable, uh, almost incredible second career uh, at the IMF, the World Bank, and the uh, Inter-American uh, Bank, all in very senior positions. So, Otaviano, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you uh, to the call to Colombia and uh, to the call and uh, your opening remarks, please, in the next eight to 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. It's really a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, I, I really think that Laura made a, a give us a good landscape of uh, the response to COVID uh, in the region and in Brazil, and add also give us a, a very good broad presentation. By the way, at the uh, the. Uh, both. Uh, in, not only in Brazil, but also in the whole region, Latin America, uh, has been uh, well uh, treated by some recent reports, both at the World Bank and the IDB. And, and you hit the nail when you mm -hmm. remark the price paid by, by growth in the region for that. Uh, let me then focus on what I would say are the structural issues underlying Brazil's dismal economic performance, because we're talking about here as something that has been for some time. The, uh, the Brazilian economy, I like to say, has been suffering from a combination of uh, a double disease, productivity anemia and public sector obesity. On the one hand, the mediocre performance of productivity in Brazil in recent decades has limited its GDP growth potential. On the other, the expansion of public spending has become increasingly incompatible with such limits on the potential expansion of GDP, particularly since the growing public spending has not achieved commensurate socioeconomic results. The deep recession that we had in 2015, 2016, followed by slow recovery in, uh, afterwards, reflected the advanced stage of evolution of that double disease which was preceded by an incubation period during which its symptoms were disguised during the, 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 the fantastic cycle uh, of growth in the, in the previous years. I would highlight infrastructure investments, improving the business environment and trade opening as ways to cope with the productivity anemia. Besides the obvious need for higher quality of education has as well been pointed by Ed. But uh, we also, need to address the phenomenon of public sector obesity and how the coronavirus pandemic crisis has led the country to uh, what one might call a macroeconomic crossroads. So within the time bounds, uh, let me say a bit about the dynamic increase in productivity. Look, more than half of per capita income growth over the past two decades has been brought about by increases in the share of the economically active population. And this is a source of expansion uh, that, is, that will decline with the ongoing aging of the population at a high speed. It's important to highlight that Brazil has, uh, get, has gotten older uh, in the last 25 years, what took 125 years in France. So the, the speed of aging in, in Brazil is really has been fast. From the mid 90s onwards, the Brazilian production per employee has increased at a snail pace rate of only 0.7% a year. Partly because the level of, of fiscal investment has remained low as highlighted by Ed, but mainly because the overall efficiency in the use of human and the material resource has remained stagnant. Uh, why? There are, for instance, factors that limit competition in domestic markets, lack of logistic infra infrastructure, 
differentiated state tax regimes, subsidies to specific firms, and so on. And uh, it's incredible. Uh, Paulo Correa, a colleague of uh, uh, an ex colleague from the bank, made a study showing that the rate of survival and resource retention in less efficient companies in Brazil is higher than in any other country, uh, a comparable country, which uh, implies uh, a price paid in terms of lower average productivity. We don't like competition, and this uh, takes a toll on productivity. Uh, Obviously, behind productiv low productivity, the quality of education uh, and the formation of human capital. Uh, well, but let's say, let, let's look then, well, we could go on here. The, the evidence about the lack of investment in infrastructure is such that, uh, but it suffice here to refer to the following. While Brazil's GDP doubled in real terms between 1990 and 2016, the stock, the stock of infrastructure capacity grew by just 27%. And that's why we have watched a decline of Brazil's infrastructure capital stock as a share of GDP. Now, uh, the, this connects with uh, the other side of the double disease that I said, with the public sector obesity. Look. Public infrastructure spending was squeezed, uh, as I mentioned, while current public spending grew by 2% above GDP. And primary government spending as a proportion of GDP rose from 22% in 1991 to 36% in 2014. While uh, public spending has stabilized since 2015 as a proportion of GDP and since 2017 has been subject to this constitutionally established absolute ceiling in real terms. But, uh, but it still have the continued expansion of mandatory current spending. And this has led the fiscal space available for public infrastructure investments to continue to shrink. So uh, one may say that the Brazil's public sector obesity has aggravated the uh, productivity anemia. Uh, the the uh, back in 2015, I'm looking at the clock. Uh, back in, in 2015, the Brazilian government asked uh, the the World Bank to uh, uh, to provide a, a public sector public spending. Uh, 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 Exam, a public spending, public spending uh, examination, uh, and later on, when this product was delivered by the bank, we had another government. It was 2017, and it was in the context of the uh, already established or planned at the time and then approved public spending cap. Uh, and the point is that I want to highlight is the following: the uh, uh, according to the parameters at the time, the public spending cap would be a reasonably mild adjustment process to the public accounts. It would imply a 0.5 percentage point of GDP adjustment in the primary surplus uh, over uh, every year, which would lead in 10 years to something like changing five percentage points, the primary surplus, and clearly the public sector debt trajectory would change dramatically. And then the, 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 the request to the World Bank was to suggest areas where uh, it would be easier for the government to, to, to find ways to obey the cap, the, the straight jacket, as I like to call it. And three areas were highlighted by the World Bank. One, obviously, the pensions. Another one, the premium. Uh, uh, accrued by 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 many uh, public jobs, public sector jobs, vis-a-vis -vis the corresponding ones in the private sector, and the third one to review the plethora of uh, of uh, uh, tax subsidies, which at the time amounted to 4.5 percentage points of GDP. Um, so the the difficulties with the the uh, the, uh, the the spending cap might have been milder. Uh, the pension reform was, was implemented, but the remainder of the agenda has, has gone to, has been on the shelves, has not been uh, implemented. 
uh, it, it's true, Laura highlighted the, the, the exactly the, the, the crossroads, the, the challenge faced this year. Uh, as we don't have a full recovery after coronavirus, and uh, there is a clear, uh, it would be welcome if we could, to some extent, replicate the, the emergency aid of last year. Uh, not to the same amount, because that was humongous, uh, impossible to be maintained as such. But uh, in, in the, guess what, the, the public sector uh, is pending uh, exam by the bank suggested a, a way as well. Uh, one of the reports of my former colleagues showed clearly the following. Uh, if you look at the existing uh, programs, social programs uh, by the Brazilian government, uh, you had uh, the absence of families that should be eligible to receive transfers. Uh, part of those who made up the contingent of uh, uh, 65 million Brazilians last year, whereas uh, but many of these families are out as uh, now we have the cadastro, but they are not, let's say, uh, inside the, the basic conditional cash transfers. At the same time, you have some families that accumulate access to two or three different programs. So an obvious way to, to let's say, to produce uh, some sort of a scheme for 2021 or later, that would be larger broader than the Bolsa Familia without reaching the, the unfeasible magnitudes of the emergency aid would be exactly to review the existing programs uh, and combine them into a uh, larger and, and broader uh, transfer scheme, uh, which would be a strong step towards uh, a minimum income scheme in Brazil. Unfortunately, President Bolsonaro apparently already closed the door to such a revamp. So we are in a situation which is re really fragile in the sense that uh, look at the yield curves of the public debt last year. Uh, at the hint of, uh, of the abandonment of the, the, the spending cap, uh, it steepened dramatically. The, the treasury was able to ev evade itself from it by resorting to short term uh, public debt issuance, but that, that has some limit. And we are in this, in this quagmire, in this crossroads, in which, uh, on the one side, it's 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 uh, it's clearly understandable the need to have uh, the uh, the the continuation of some sort of uh, public transfers uh, at a higher level than the 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 Bolsa Familia, but on the other, we are really cannot put into risk the perception of uh, risk associated to the public debt because then we would have a nightmare. Thank you. Find us the phrase that's often quoted here in, in Brazil that Brazil is not for beginners. It's a very complex situation. Uh, lots of deep uh, uh, structural problems. Uh, uh, always, as Ed Amin mentioned, at, at some point of a crisis point or another, but, uh, but no lack certainly of good quality ideas uh, to, to how for reform in the public sector. So it's a very mixed and very complicated picture at, at, at all times. And thank you, Otaviano, for adding so so well to that. Um, uh, I, that feeds in nicely, I think, uh, to our final uh, uh, speaker and presenter of Open Remarks, who joins us also from Europe today. I believe he's at the OECD in Paris, where Alvaro Pereira, Alvaro, are you there? Uh, yeah, is the director of the Country Studies Branch at the Economics Department of the OECD. Uh, he provides leadership in the coordination and management of the activities of, uh, of the directorate and ensures that uh, the OECD reports are at the forefront and their analysis at the very forefront of the international political economy agenda. I think each of the previous speakers, Alvaro, has read your reports that kind of finds a way uh, or should find a way to include not only the points made, but the references cited uh, as standard operating procedure. Uh, if, you, if one takes the time to read through these country studies produced by the OECD, the latest being the 2020 report on Brazil, it is uh, manifested the case that they are at the forefront of uh, international political agenda uh, in looking at many, many countries, even countries like Brazil, which are not formally members yet. Uh, their viewpoint is critical of national governments and yet also supportive and, and positive. Uh, Alvaro, uh, prior to joining the OECD, held very senior positions in the economics area in the government of Portugal, 
uh, where is he, of which he is a native, with a particular concern for employment issues. So maybe that will factor in a little bit into Alvaro's remarks. So Alvaro, the, the, for the next eight or 10 minutes, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. This is a, it's a pleasure being here. For me, it's even more because of a, well, I need to share my screen. If you allow me, though, I would appreciate yes. it. Um, yeah. uh, for me, uh, most of my career I was, before I was in government, I was in academia. So for me, uh, participating with academic events and, uh, and this type of debates, uh, it's something that I really uh, always appreciate very much. So I'll be focused uh, not on the COVID response. I'll talk about the structural problems of Brazil and what type of, uh, what, you know, not now, but I think in a few months time, when hopefully the pandemic is over and we are all go back, not to normal, but almost. Um, and so when the fiscal response go away and uh, that sort of thing, um, I think what, what are the big structural reforms that Brazil should undertake? I think it's important to uh, highlight that um, Brazil has undertaken interesting and significant reforms in the last few years, right? And I think this is not only uh, this is true with, even with the, the, the former Rousseff uh, administration, there was already talk about reforms, at least with the OECD for sure. And then the Temer administration, there were some interesting reforms. And you know, certainly the last one on pensions, I think it was something that we were waiting for a long time. Uh, I, I, I'm not able still to share my screen. If, uh, if, uh, I, think, I think Isabella is going about to make you the, uh, allow that to happen. You could just maybe continue for just a minute. We're working on it. I'll that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. So I'll focus basically on, on some of these reforms. In terms of forecasts, I should say that uh, our latest economic forecast for Brazil, we are forecasting about 2.6, 2.7 this year, and uh, about uh, a bit less next year. But obviously, we're not talking about fantastic rates of growth, uh, especially compared to other countries that have opened up uh, a lot more. So now it's OK. Thank you very much. Um, so um, OK, let me just go to. Show. Okay, so uh, basically, what are the structural constraints to growth in Brazil? Uh, well, we, we, we do think that there is quite a few um, uh, reforms that needs to, uh, to be done. There's been some reforms lately, and uh, which is good. You know, the last, the, pre the previous one, big reform moment was in, in the 90s. Um, but we also think that if there's an ambi ambitious reform program, we estimate um, that this could add almost one percentage point more every year um, over the next 15 years. Uh, and so we think this could be quite important. There'll be adjustment costs, but I think there'll be a substantial increase. Well, uh, I think Ed uh, has already mentioned this, this figure in terms of productivity. What is striking about Brazil is exactly that Brazil has been lagging substantially, in fact, getting, uh, getting worse, I think, in the last few years regarding productivity. Um, and even compared to countries like Chile, Chile is not doing great but in, in terms of productivity lately. But you look at what, what happens to the Asian economies and, you know, I could add Malaysia, I could I, even Thailand, and they would look a lot better than, than Brazil in the last few years. So I think this is a big issue. And we also estimated what could they do in terms of uh, to lift incomes. Lift incomes. And we do think that uh, reforms, and I'll come back to that a bit later, would reforms could lift incomes and could, could boost growth uh, in, the, in the next few years. Uh, also, reforms uh, by giving more growth uh, would help that sustainability. So this is that sustainability analysis. So the baseline is the, the black line. You can see that we think that the baseline will lead uh, to a, a debt uh, to GDP ratio around 100% uh, uh, by 2024, 25. But uh, if there is slower fiscal adjustment or no structural reforms, then this could uh, easily uh, be much higher. Uh, certainly part of the obese, as, as I think uh, we heard before, the obese public sector. But if there is a, an ambitious structural reform package and fiscal prudence, uh, we don't see any big problems in terms of public debt trajectory. But you know, these two conditions have to be met for sure. So what type of reforms are we talking about? And what are the, the structural impediments of higher growth in Brazil? Well, for me, this is one of the most striking graphs. This, is gra this graph talks about how restrictive are regulations in Brazil. And this could be either because uh, there's too much state control, but even more importantly, what type of uh, barriers you have for entrepreneurship? So uh, you know, is it difficult for you to start a company? Is it difficult to, um, uh, to continue uh, a, a company? and uh, licensing procedures. And in fact, for licensing procedures, uh, uh, complexity of regulations, uh, barriers to entrepreneurship, Brazil always scores extremely high 
but in the wrong side of the table. So, you know, basically uh, it's too restrictive. Brazil needs to help its entrepreneurs by opening up, by, by fighting bureaucracy, um, and, and uh, as I said, lowering the barriers for entrepreneurship, because this would could uh, spur a substantial increase um, and, you know, creation of jobs, but also growth uh, in the near future. Also, another thing that I think was already highlighted is exactly how close Brazil continues to be, right? So this is obviously, we take into account um, the size of the population, but even compared to other countries that are even bigger than Brazil, Brazil is really close. So this is imports and exports as percentage of GDP. You can see Brazil is exactly in the wrong side of the table. It's way too close. And so uh, this is something that is not helping. And an explanation for this will come next. Uh, obviously, we know that trade barriers have been, uh, are way too high, and not only for all products, but you know, even more uh, uh, punishing, I think, and this is what I think somebody was mentioning before, uh, there's uh, not enough investment. Well, in, one of the reasons why there's not enough investment is that importing, uh, they have to import uh, capital, and importing capital is way too expensive, partly because of the tariffs. So applied tariffs to capital goods is you know, the, the only country that has higher tariffs than Brazil is Argentina. And Argentina is not a really great example in terms of being open economy or, or to have uh, uh, a, a fantastic manufacturing sector um, that is exporting all over the world. Also very important is that these expensive imported inputs uh, are hurting competitiveness. Uh, as I said, this is the share of the imported inputs. And you can see that the share of Brazil is really low. But more importantly, I'll show you the next one. For me, it's one of the most striking pictures that I, that I think about, that, I, that we have about Brazil. And this is basically the map of global value chains estimated by the OECD. And this tells you the connections, the size of the, of the connections, which is the, the bubble that it can have, can have for every single country. And then the connections are the arrows. And so the, the, the bigger the, the integration, uh, the greater the integration of the, on global value chains, um, uh, the more connections you're going to have and the bigger is the bubble. And you can see that Brazil not only has a very small bubble, but also there's almost uh, no connections. Basically Brazil is almost an island in global value chains. And for a country like Brazil with the potential of Brazil and the importance of Brazil and the population of Brazil, this is a waste. Uh, you know, it's a wasted opportunity that Brazil, rather than exporting mostly agriculture and, and, uh, and uh, um, commodity products, which is fine, you know, I think they should continue but there's a, a missing link in terms of services and industry that you can see this in this map. Brazil continues to be almost an island in the global value chain uh, uh, part. And this is exactly because it's too closed and because of it, they, they have too much high tariffs. We estimate, I don't want to get too much into that, otherwise I'll run out of time, but you know, we estimated that lower barriers will boost growth and uh, will lead to a substantial increase in trade. Also, we estimated that uh, in fact, if they open up and they, they lower tariffs, this will disproportionately uh, uh, help the poor. Uh, and this is basically by this hour of income, you can see that uh, by far the ones that will benefit the most would be, would be exactly the poorest part of the, of the population. But on the other hand, what type of other structural impediments do they have? Somebody already mentioned infrastructure quality. This is the quality of road infrastructure. And you can see worse than Brazil of all the set, set of countries that we have here. Only, only really Costa Rica, but you know, compared to other countries of the region, Brazil is not uh, does not have great infrastructure. Uh, another thing is bureaucracy. Going back to what I said before about licensing, you know, this is a World Bank data. You know, hours required to prepare taxes. You know, this is great for tax lawyers. So if you are a tax lawyer in Brazil, you're probably doing great. But if you are a, an entrepreneur, if you are a business, this is not good news. This means that you know it takes too long, and for personal for families too. But you know, this takes too long uh, to prepare taxes, and this is a burden um, and on, on people and firms that you know our pay is paid afterwards in terms of competitiveness. Another issue that we think that is important, besides public sector reform that has already been mentioned, is exactly judicial efficiency. It's always difficult uh, to, to do judicial reform, but you can see the average time needed to resolve civil and commercial cases in Brazil. Is really bad. They, are, you know, Brazil is worse than Italy, which is, you know, it's it's and Portugal, which is really, you know, it's 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 getting to the limit where it's really really inefficient. So I think this is important to highlight. Judicial reform is important, and you can see that on on the other hand, uh, the demand for litigation in Brazil 
is really high, um, partly because perhaps there are too many lawyers, uh, perhaps, but you know, there's certainly a lot of litigation and this has to be reduced uh, so that we have also more judicial efficiency. Another issue that we think it is that there's too many barriers in terms of regulated professions. This is just uh, basically for uh, law professions, so law lawyers and, and notaries. And you can see that restrictions to the entry of new people, new firms, um, in, and uh, new lawyers and notaries are the highest of all the countries we follow. Right. So this is this is uh, this means that um, you create a lot less jobs and you are a lot less efficient because of these restrictions. And then, just to end up, uh, we also have uh, plenty of data. I had plenty of slides on education, so I'm not going to go over them. But education, you know, there's been a lot of investment, but the outcomes are not great. This is uh, basically showing exactly and the different format of the data on PISA that we've seen before. So Brazil scores very low and low education attainments very often is associated with high informality, which, which is another characteristic of the, the, uh, the Brazilian economy, in which informality still is way too high, about 40%. And likely with COVID will get worse uh, in the next few months. And so we talk a lot of in the last survey about uh, what, what should they do. Um, and we think that especially if they want to have a stronger industrial sector, vocational training should be a priority and investing more in dual and apprenticeship education should be a priority for employability and for, uh, for more jobs. And so we have plenty of recommendations. I don't want to go to that. But basically what we think is after, um, after we have um, the COVID crisis, so obviously we think that the response has been in terms of policy response uh, has supported families especially, but we think that afterwards, uh, especially when the pandemic is over, the fiscal situation has to be a again a priority. And more than that, uh, I think it's time to open Brazil so that they can create a lot more jobs and growth. Thanks. And by the way, the external uh, angle of uh, uh, emphasizing the problems in productivity and education, almost one could be looking at this without knowing much about Brazil and wonder how the country keeps going at all sometimes or why it's not totally discouraging, uh, which I don't think it is, but, uh, but those, uh, you do help to, to show some of the areas where Brazil really needs to improve. And you also show the great value of those data sets at the OECD and allow us to measure things that were maybe beyond our, our ability to measure easily in a comparative sense, such as labor market regulations and, and so forth. And also calling attention to the need uh, for vocational training and, and support, more direct measures of support um, to, uh, to the unemployed. But I'm gonna make a little bit of a de decision. I hope this is gonna, I'm gonna turn now to Al Fischler for his remarks, but I'm also gonna make a little bit of a deviation from the, from the plans. I'm gonna also call on Jan after Al's done, on Jan and on Deborah uh, for further comments that we may wish to make, maybe in reaction to the Brazilian uh, commentators or any other points you'd like to raise, but we'll, we'll de dedicate the meetings beyond Al's uh, uh, else uh, prepared comments, uh, we'll, we'll turn then next to Jan and to, to Deborah and bring them in and see if we can mix up the conversation globally in Brazil a little, a little more. But right now it's my pleasure for, I think, all of us, Al, to welcome Al, uh, uh, Albert Fischlow, um, uh, kind of in the needs no introduction category, an economist, professor emeritus at, at, uh, of international public affairs at Columbia. And I think he taught some other smaller institutions along the way. Cal Berkeley and Yale, among others, uh, during his illustrious career. He's the former director of Columbia's uh, Institute of Latin American Studies and a co-founder of the Lemon Center for the Study of Brazil at Columbia. He's dedicated a lifetime to understanding Brazil critically and yet supportively. Uh, a lot more could be said about Al um, and his many contributions to the study of Brazil and to Latin America. He's, let me start by saying he's still at it. And uh, maybe the most succinct summary about Al Fischler is he's the consummate scholar, teacher, and, and friend of Brazil. So Al, and he's also more careful with the time than I am, but so I'm gonna turn it over to you all for your, your comments and then we'll, we'll, we'll call upon uh, the other commentators. Al, welcome. Well, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, or now it's, uh, the afternoon for most of our listeners. This has been a very interesting uh, conversation. Uh, I think I would raise 
a couple of general points and also try to bring in politics into the matter. Uh, because what we have been lacking is precisely a sense of the general resistance to globalization, which has been characteristic of the global economy over the last several years. And that resistance has given rise to a degree of nationalism and populism, which is found in a whole variety of countries as they try to make decisions in this difficult moment when one is dealing with the problem of the pandemic. The pandemic is unique in terms of its degree of internationalization. The extent of the speed of finding a recovery and the enormous competition that exists in making available this particular ingredient, which turns out to be a very central ingredient, not merely of health policy, but also of economic policy. Who gets what from where do you get the Russian uh, attempt at its solution uh, or do you get the new magnificent oh. Pfizer and German combination or, or the Moderna uh, version, which is a dramatic change. Uh, this really has changed the international climate. And I think one should not underestimate that particular element when we are talking about economics, because it also affects policy. Countries which now move in a direction of nationalism and populism don't use international trade as a solution to the problem. The problems rather are different in character. And what is historically the important component in Brazil is Brazil's rate of participation in international trade has always been very, very low. And you have at the moment in Brazil a competition between two alternatives. One alternative is to liberalize Brazil. And that liberalization has started by dealing with pension. I wanna remind everyone that virtually every government in Brazil starts with pensions. And they start with pensions simply because as Otavio reminded us, the demographics have changed in Brazil and Brazil is constantly getting older. And therefore the ratio of people who are at retirement 
ages is quite different than those who are young. And as that rate changes uh, over time, you constantly have to change what the rules are for access to pension. But once you've done pensions, you don't do anything else. I recall all of the discussions going back to the 1980s, when after pensions, you were going to have reforms occurring in the manufacturing sector and eliminate uh, public sector firms. You were going to have all kinds of new mechanisms that would increase competition. Uh, you had any trust being uh, put up, et cetera but you always get around them. And you get around them because of the legal structure. Brazil has a legal structure. When you pass laws, but you never pass the regulating legislation necessary to provide enforcement to the laws. And all during that kind of period, you increase the bureaucracy. Brazil is one of the most bureaucratic environments that exists. And no sooner do you find ways of trying to deal with something than you find ways around that particular problem. The other thing I want to say is that you have a fundamental political problem in Brazil, which everyone now resorts to on a regular level, which is impeachment. Every time you have a government where you don't like the policies that are being followed, you bring up impeachment. And don't forget, even in the Temer structure, you had a vote on impeachment that took place twice in order to see whether he was going to be impeached. The nature of the political structure in Brazil is not of the kind that is enables a degree of effective structure. Indeed, I'm afraid that's what the United States has learned from the close relationship between Brazil and the United States during the Trump administration. It has learned to do the same thing and to have all of these complicated mechanisms that go into effect through actual uh, uh, presidential uh, uh, decisions which violate laws and change laws at the convenience of the government. Uh, Brazil at the moment is now in a situation where the politics are really quite disturbing because the politics has created a central group within the Congress 
which is now trying to manage the country. And that Congress is used to one thing in the case of Brazil, which is getting some benefit as a result of doing so. And that kind of transfer makes all of the bureaucracy more difficult, makes the share of the government larger rather than reduce smaller and more efficient. The solution in Brazil is not having the state do everything, which is the notion that you can break through by having the state take all of the necessary decisions and create the increases in productivity, nor will it be the private sector and the elimination of state participation in the economy with a set of particular controlled subsidies, which are necessary in the case of some of the industries that you want to develop. Brazil is at a turning point. Brazil, in terms of the projections ahead, will not be able to do it. Brazil has an investment rate of 14%. The investment rate of 14% will not enable you to do anything. And you will still have all of the infrastructure requirements and all of the difficulties. Note that no one mentioned here the fact that Brazil concluded an agreement with the EU in terms of setting up an agreement in trade. Brazil has no agreements in trade that actually take place. They go on and on and have discussions and never make it to the final stages of implementation because no one wants to believe that there is the possibility of having greater equity along with the possibility of a degree of globalization. So I come back to uh, the fundamental point here, which is the politics. You've got two movements at the moment. You've got Paulo Guedes on the one side who believes that you can go to the free market. And you've got on the other side, a military grouping which believes that you have to go back to the military, which knew how to generate a high rate of growth and could manage to do things and was clearly the way to go. Brazil doesn't have much time left. If it doesn't manage to grow over the course of the next several years, it's not gonna grow. And even now, all of the projections for 2022 and 2023 are of the order of magnitude of 2.3% a year which is not enough to begin to deal with all of the real problems that exist. Yeah, thank um, you very much. Um, Albert, thank you very much. That was a uh, masterful, if sobering, 
final comments uh, from you and adding points too about about the politics, frankly, which hadn't uh, come up uh, till now, and I think very provocative comments. I, I have a problem, which is a very typical uh, uh, problem that I face, is I've got too many good people and too little time, and I know there may be some speakers who need to leave, uh, or uh, uh, but I, the audience is still with us on this. I think they're all from the chat room. They're enjoying the conversation very, very much. So if I could, and if you can, but don't be obligated, speakers, you can stay for another five or eight minutes. Um, we'll, I'd like to turn to Jan and to Deborah, at least have some some back and forth between the global and, and European views, as, as it were, and, uh, uh, and, and what uh, these wonderful speakers from Brazil have challenged us with. Jan, um, and I, I neglected to say Jan himself has a book out, out on Brazil, also by Rutledge, on the Lava Jato process in Brazil. So that's uh, something I should have mentioned at, at the outside. We're very proud of the edited volume that Jan and his colleague Paul Lagunas have put together. But Jan, Maybe just it could, in the spirit of this change in the role of the state, give a little global perspective in response to what you've heard, and then I'll turn to Deborah. Yeah, I'll be very brief since time is of essence. I think it was really remarkable to see actually uh, the response and what we see in Europe, as Deborah portrayed it. And by the way, the EIB annual report, which just came out, is certainly a must for everybody who wants to understand fully uh, what's happening in the European economy. Uh, and I think I'll just select a few few points that I think are important in the sense that the asymmetric uh, recovery, I think is very important and we see it in Brazil as well. And I think that's something that really one can learn going across uh, both in terms of sectors, in terms of uh, countries or uh, states, let's say the inequality uh, increase, et cetera, very important. And uh, the, um, emphasis on education and training that's needed uh, in Europe, I think that is goes hand in hand with uh, what we see in, in Brazil. So in that sense, it's uh, really important. Um, uh, I think Laura brought in a number of important points and uh, you know, I think driving home the basic point that Brazil really has had major problem coping, coping with COVID. But on the other hand, it really well compared to a number of other countries in terms of the fiscal uh, response and uh, and therefore that poverty even decreased. I mean, it's so unusual in terms of what we see in the world these days that I think that's something that's certainly worth uh, doing. I think Ed made again, number of points adding to it. I think the low investment is fascinating. Deborah uh, shows in the study that uh, I mentioned that investment has been uh, going down in Europe dramatically during this period. But in Brazil, it seems to be more of a long-term phenomenon, right? So uh, the question is, you know, to what extent is it temporary, uh, long-term, and so on? I think the, the fact that uh, if I read the graphs that you indicated for Brazil correctly, TFP has actually gone down. So it's not like it's growing slower, but it's like forgetting, right? It's sort of uh, forgetting what we know how to do. We do it more, more poorly. <laughs> so that is a big issue because when you look at countries like Germany, for instance, where uh, productivity growth has slowed down dramatically and has created big discussion, Japan being also a good example, you know, those countries have not quite lost knowledge. They've uh, increased very slowly compared to others, right? So here we have a fundamentally different issue, I think, which is, which is really important. But on the other hand, then, uh, as that points out, there's been innovation in the financial market, something that Europe is trying to do and has hard time doing, right? And Brazil has managed to do it. So I think that's really important to realize that there are pros and cons, you know, on both sides. Um, I think that Ottaviano, in addition to everything else, wins the prize for the best quote of the day, productivity, anemia, and public sector obesity. I think that's uh, <laughs> definitely a, a, you know, a must. And, uh, and the point of uh, aging, population, which we see in some of the European countries as well as a big problem, and the low competition, right? That's sort of a big issue, I think, that's really uh, to be tackled. And uh, that goes deep into the culture, business culture, policy culture, and so on. And um, uh, Alvaro has, of course, added to it in terms of uh, the additional uh, things and the need to change the education system and open Brazil, which has been, of course, echoed and uh, elaborated on by, by Al. And, uh, and I think the 
one point also that Al made that's important is that the enforcement of law is inadequate or, or in a way not there and that bureaucracy is strong and inefficient. That uh, That's a European phenomenon, Kafkaesque, right? That's really sort of going back to Prague. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, I think that countries that really have efficient bureaucracy in terms of the Max Weber type, right? Can do really well. Efficient bureaucracy, efficient state is really important, and especially in this period of COVID and uh, post-COVID, hopefully. So I think that point, Al, you've driven home, you know, very, very well. So that's so my points in terms of bringing things together. I so appreciate that, Jan. Uh, a, a, a great summary of what we've heard. I'm going to turn to Deborah, and then I'm also a little pre-warning. I'd love to go for a minute. I'm, I'm light, what they call it in the U.S. and anyway, a lightning round of comments from our, our panelists, and then we'll conclude. I promise. But we're getting so many uh, 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 comments uh, in through the Q&A in, in the chat room. I know people are anxious to hear it. We can stay just through that. We'll hear Bebra and then maybe give a minute or two uh, to each of our, our, our uh, Brazilian uh, uh, experts. Debra, please over to you. Thank you very much. I think, uh, I, think the, the, I would go very, um, with a very similar remark to, uh, to what Jana just was making. And I, I was uh, struck by the similarities in terms of challenge uh, that we see at the European level uh, and uh, at the Brazilian level. As well, uh, in uh, Europe, uh, one of the elements uh, that we are uh, uh, thinking on a policy point of view is uh, when is the moment uh, to switch uh, the policy support, the, the policy support that was uh, acted uh, uh, in the immediate of the COVID crisis. So where does it, when uh, to switch it uh, to more targeted the support uh, to accelerate the transformation of the economy? So using, uh, kind of uh, the, uh, the crisis as an opportunity for, uh, for uh, transforming an economy. And uh, we are looking into that, uh, particularly having in mind uh, the digital and green transition uh, that are uh, quite uh, some uh, challenge for the European economy. And I'm sure also for, uh, from what I hear now for the Brazilian economy. So what we are trying to do at the policy level is uh, trying to think uh, when is uh, the moment for passing uh, from uh, um, a more uh, undiscriminated uh, support uh, to firms, uh, to individuals, uh, to more targeted uh, support uh, that uh, would also allow accelerating uh, this uh, transformation. And this uh, could happen, uh, both uh, if you think of what I mentioned uh, before in terms of uh, um, social, social, uh, social insurance support, uh, tying uh, it uh, with uh, the request for people uh, for retraining uh, while uh, in uh, social insurance schemes uh, on the one side, to corporate uh, with uh, more targeted uh, support for a specific investment uh, in energy efficiency or in digitalization. So try to have uh, a... Um, uh, uh, more targeting, uh, accelerating uh, the transformation of the economy. And I, I believe that this, uh, this could be something uh, from what I hear uh, that, uh, um, that uh, could be quite applied also in uh, the Brazilian case. And Thank I you. think I close here. Thank you so much, Deborah. Uh, Thank you very, very much. And now, let's just go to the lightning round, if we could. And I think I'll go in the same order in which the speakers uh, first addressed us, and so well, maybe just a minute or two, please, um, excuse me for the ridiculous brevity uh, of that, but uh, Laura, let's start with you. Okay, uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, okay, so commenting on these more structural challenges and, and, and long run um, agenda that we, we need to, to design and have to start with, because I don't think uh, we even have one uh, and we haven't had a, a, a growth or a development uh, agenda in the past years, I would say. Um, First of all, I mean, I do agree that structural reforms are necessary, and I, I will also stress the need for a tax reform, which hasn't been mentioned. And I think in the case of Brazil, um, not only in terms of simplifying, but also uh, redistributing and turning the tax system uh, more fair and, and progressive, uh, that would be, in my view, one of the central uh, 
and more crucial uh, points we need to to really um, think about and and have in the in the as an urgent matter uh, in in Congress. Um, and when I and I, but while also a public sector reform, and I agree that all of these, and including the pension reform that has already been approved. Uh, have their their benefits and, and and have to be thought of in their own purposes and 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 what what they can bring in terms of say more efficiency to the public sector if that's the goal um, more progressiveness in the tax system if that's the goal my concern though is that the way these structural reforms have been thought of in the past years in Brazil are um, in a way um, setting uh, the, the, the reduction of the size of the state as the goal itself. And, 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 and as if by just reducing uh, spending and the size of the state relative to GDP, we would uh, get more growth and, and, and solve all of our problems. And that's really been proving wrong. I mean, if we look at the past years, uh, this is really not uh, what we we haven't been managing to, I think, address um, public sector efficiency, for instance, by just establishing a cap on public spending that is uh, um, freezing spending for the next 10 years. I mean, this is not happening. Distributive conflicts uh, still goes in the same ways. And then we managed to, let's say, uh, some some public sector servants in the military manage to get their raise because they have, uh, as Al has said in, in our political system, uh, more power of influence. And on the other hand, we don't, do not manage to, to have space and physical space for expanding uh, social protection and, and things that we think are, 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 are crucial in the long run. So uh, it's not just about reducing Spending, and I think the world is understanding this now, and and that's where we we're really struggling at a different position than than the European um, the, the Europeans are, or even multilateral institutions. I mean, if we look at the IMF latest uh, fiscal monitor and all the policies that have been recommended, uh, of course, uh, we're not an advanced economy. Our public debt levels are not. Uh, taken the exact same way, our interest rates on public debt are not the same, etc. But still, even for countries with problems of external debt, which Brazil does not have, the external sovereign debt, and that's where I, I would point towards a comment that has been made here. I mean, we do have a situation that has less challenges than what we had in the 80s when it comes to inflation control, external debt. I mean, we, we had the capacity to spend so much in 2020 and to increase our debt levels as we did to, 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 to deal with an emergency without incurring in any solvency problems or in, in, even in a, in, a, in a situation of, I don't know, a default or anything like that because we are at a different position. And the IMF, even for countries that have a problem of financing constraints that is much uh, tougher than ours at the moment, uh, is of trying to avoid uh, a solution that is basically just cutting spending in areas that have proved to be so important during this crisis, such as health, education, um, and, and social protection, and instead trying to do tax and transfer schemes where we tax the rich to spend more in infrastructure and in social protection. That has been the recommendation for countries with that situation in terms of that sustainability that is much more dramatic than our own. And, and I, I don't understand why, in our case, we are starting a year in 2021, given how important the, 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 the program, the cash relief program has been and other uh, lessons that we have taken from the multiplier, multiplier effects of reducing inequality through um, schemes such as the Auxilio Emergencial, given the low propensity to consume that the rich have and the very high propensity to consume that the poor have in a very unequal country. Why is that that we cannot even start discussing the possibility of, let's say, financing a permanent program, which I agree with Otaviano has to be uh, much smaller in size uh, than what we had in, in, in an emergency in 2020. But to, to have a more redistributive fiscal policy 
through uh, taxation as well. Why is this completely out of the agenda? And and one of the the problems, and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly mention the. I mean, we have produced studies, and the, of course, the impact of reducing inequality, Otaviana, is much higher if we finance a scheme of transfers through taxation at the top, uh, given how the characteristics of our inequality, which is really very high concentration at the top, but not such much of disparities uh, between the middle and the bottom of the distribution. The impact of this, both in terms of multiplier effects, growth and inequality reduction is much stronger than the impact of doing what you suggest, suggested, meaning removing money from other social programs that usually benefit the middle of the distribution in Brazil to move to the, the bottom. And the reason why we only discuss this type of reallocation is that we have at the moment a restriction, which is given by a spending cap, which is not applied as a fiscal rule in any country in the world. And I, I, I would like to point to that because I think this is also, I'm not denying all our structural problems, our inefficiency problems, and other things that we need to address, address through the reforms. But we have a system now that is basically preventing any real growth in public spending. Even if we manage to get more in terms of tax receipts, this cannot be used to, to expand social, social uh, spending in anything because the cap is basically static and and it's not even linked to the dynamics of public debt. And I mean, here it's a, a crossroads, I agree. We are at a crossroads. And I think the crossroads uh, have to do, of course, with being responsible in fiscal uh, terms uh, on the one hand, but this does not prevent us from discussing uh, using fiscal policy, public investment in infrastructure as a means uh, to to boost our uh, a green uh, and a social socially inclusive recovery as other countries are uh, thinking Laura, of. I, 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 so, I so appreciate these comments, and you you just uh, volunteered to be on our one of our upcoming sessions. We'll look more closely at the fiscal issues, and I think we'll certainly have Octaviano and maybe one of the others be there as well. Thank you very very much. Let me interrupt though. Um, and uh, and move on move the uh, ball uh, to uh, to Ed Aman. Ed, uh, your your final uh, 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 concluding comments. Yeah, well, thanks very much, uh, Tom, and uh, uh, thanks for the for the input from the various members of the audience. Um, I think what the key take home for me from this particular session, and I think thinking about Brazil more generally, is where is the growth in the future going to come from? from where will increases in living standards emerge? And again, we come down to the question of productivity and we come down to the question of which sectors is Brazil going to occupy in a global economy in the future? And these are fundamental questions, but they have a tie-in to the fiscal issue, which has just been mentioned. And that is to get some of these sectors off the ground, you need a degree of pump priming expenditure, you need investment in critical education, uh, critical infrastructure, and that requires a reprofiling of public sector spending. And I would agree that imposing a cap uh, won't necessarily need to a reprofiling. So, although the public sector may be obese, um, you know, in a sense, the fat is going into the right direction, and uh, you, be you begin to to boost growth. And I, I think that's um, long been a problem with Brazil. Um, it's uh, a matter of you know insufficient. Uh, economic diversification, poor productivity, and a public sector which has kind of constrained itself from dealing with those issues. And, um, you know, to get around that is going to require a lot of focus, but it's also, and this is going back to um, Al Stepan's point, it's also a matter of, um, <laughs> Al Fischer, sorry, um, um, it's also a matter of political will absolutely vital the political will exists to do that and to move the whole process forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, just very final and very brief comments, Ottaviano. With thanks to Laura and to Ed, Ottaviano, and then, and then Alvaro, and then we'll conclude. Yes, very, very briefly. I agree with Laura about, uh, with the fact that the, the overriding issue is quality of public spending. And I think it's not contestable 
the fact that we, ha we have seen over the last decades a humongous, a very, very fast rise in, in public spending without having, as I illustrated with the infrastructure spending, something commensurate to that. So we do have a problem with the quality of public spending, regardless of the size. Uh, and also from the income distribution standpoint, uh, you know, look at all the studies done by, by uh, uh, Nora Lustig and at the World Bank and even by the Brazilian uh, Ministry of, of Economy or Finance. And they will show that when one takes into account the tax incidence and the destination of the, the, the government spending, the Brazilian public sector is a reverse Robin Hood. It concentrates income or uh, despite the Bolsa Familia and so on, the whole impact of the Brazilian public sector is, is upward, not downward. It's incredible. So the, the uh, spending cap was a, a desperate strategy that has shown to be probably not the most, uh, let's say, effective one. Uh, it was like, let's use my image of obesity. Okay, so the patient is obese and cannot, uh, and cannot hold itself uh, to a diet. So let's put a straight jacket and then force it to implement structural reform so as to change, to move the needle uh, with respect to the automatic spending uh, that rise year after year on whatever be. So uh, the problem is that we had the, 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 uh, the, the spending cap, the straight jacket, but we don't have the diet. The diet has not uh, uh, moved ahead. So the problem <laughs> we should focus <laughs> Is, is on the diet. Uh, we do have a problem of quality of public spending. Second point, it's great that uh, uh, Alvaro gave us de some details on the business environment. I only mentioned it on passing, but it's a key component of the productivity anemia in Brazil. Brazil has one of the lousiest business environments uh, in the world in some areas like taxes. There are, uh, when you compare the 100 89 countries covered by the doing business report by the bank on tax. Brazil has only two countries in the world uh, worse than Brazil when it comes to complexity and, 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 and waste. In the, the, the lousy business environment means a toll. You have resource in Brazilian economy, human and material resource that are used, that are wasted. Uh, implementing tasks re relative to the business uh, environment. Fabiana, I'm going to also step in. It's been a wonderful year. Let's finish on that high and passionate note there. And I certainly enjoyed the dialogue that you and and uh, and Laura have started, and which will be continued. But I do need to move on. Lunchtime here in Brazil, and I'm seeing some of the audience uh, uh, and some of the speakers do have to go. But thank you so very very much for that. But Alvaro, you you. Uh, uh, from outside Brazil, the final the final word, and then we'll close. Well, I think it's important to say that Brazil is in much better shape than it was in the past, right? So I, I think it's important to realize this, uh, both in terms of macroeconomic stability uh, and in terms of uh, economic and social development. So Brazil is much better. The question is, how do you take it from the second division to the first division? That's what we're talking about. And this is why you need the reform. So I agree that the fiscal situation is an important issue. But, you know, as I said, uh, uh, you need to take the second step, which is you don't need the money to, to lower your tariffs. You don't need the money to cut bureaucracy. You don't need money to make uh, taxes more efficient, or at least it's not, not so, so dramatic. And so we're talking about reforms that will vastly improve the business climate at the same time that uh, you know, is able to, to bring more productivity and, and more growth. You know, as I said, Brazil has improved dramatically. I give you one institution that has improved dramatically and it's a key issue, which is inflation, right? So, you know, inflation is at historically low because we have very good, competent uh, central bank that is independent. It used to, it didn't used to be, and it was an innovation that I think it paid off. But I think the big question for Brazil is how to reform. So there's been some reforms. The question is how to reform from now onwards, and in particular, uh, I think it's important to realize that by lowering tariffs and by cutting bureaucracy and so on, you are going to go against very powerful vested interests. But, you know, either a government is willing to do it and fight the vested interests for the sake of Brazil, 
or Brazil will remain in the second division for a long time. And I think Brazil should be not only in the first division, but it should be competing for the top of the first division. But for that, they need three forms. Thanks. That's a good plan to end it on. Jan, I, I, I'm going to let you wrap it up. Uh, my personal thanks, my personal thanks to you, Laura, to Otaviano, to Ed, to Deborah, to uh, Alvaro, Otaviano, everybody, uh, Alfishlo, thanks for being with us. Jan, you, 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 the, the concluding remarks are yours. Yes, we will wrap up. I think that there really isn't much to add. I, I would like to again reiterate that all the contributions were extremely valuable. And, uh, and I think we put together a mosaic of uh, that tells the picture, which is uh, you know, very, very important both for Europe uh, from the presentations we had. The global picture yesterday dovetails very nicely that there, there is a big challenge for the entire world that we basically have uh, China moving very fast, the US most likely being kind of second, Europe uh, slower, but uh, definitely uh, taking important steps to move ahead. And I think today's discussion indicated that Brazil has the potential. It indicated it could realize it in the past, the number of steps that have been taken, but uh, there's obviously a lot to do. But I think the um, uh, roadmap that has been charted by the participants today is very sensible and it's just a question of political will and really implementing it. But sometimes a crisis is a very good catalyst and could lead to it. So I think this is what the policymakers should take and, and run with it. So thank you very much. This has been a really impressive uh, lineup. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye now. Thanks thank so much. You. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.